Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Writing the NIH R01 Research Grant, Strategies for Success, presented by Dr. Christopher Dance, President and Owner of MedCom Consulting. I'm Christy Jewell of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labroots and sponsored by Leica Microsystems. For more information on our sponsor, please visit leica-microsystems.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them in the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of your presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credit. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd now like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Christopher Dant. Dr. Dant is a PhD trained investigator and consultant in the biomedical field. He lectures and consults widely in academia and industry on manuscript writing, NIH and NSF career and research grants, and basic scientific writing skills for scientists. His business, MedCom Consulting, serves academic clients to review and write NIH grants, as well as peer-reviewed manuscripts. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Dan, you may now begin your presentation. Good day. My lecture today focuses on writing the research grant from the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, one of the most sought after and popular sources of medical research funding in the world. And it's from an institute that has funded scientists that have received world recognized accolades and Nobel prizes for their groundbreaking achievements in medical science. The information that I'm going to present today um, is from my many years of over 20 or 30 years of experience in working with investigators at academic centers in the United States and present uh, information and advice that has been vetted by the NIH itself and many uh, professors who have uh, won R01 uh, and K or career grants from the NIH. Perhaps many of you have written a grant, uh, but probably a lot of you have not written one and or even know the specifics of the NIH and their grant system. But I want to let you know that the background and specific material I'm going to present to you today is vital for anyone in academia, whether you're a lab technician, a biologist, a student, a PhD student, a postdoctoral fellow, a junior or a senior faculty, or even an administrator uh, working in the field of grants, because the information will frame how you consider, plan, carry out, and communicate your research. If you conduct any medical research, you first have to understand how to communicate not only your methods and results, but more importantly, why you are conducting the research in the first place, its rationale, its significance, and how it is unique and innovative and most importantly, how your findings will impact the future of research with a goal of uh, uncovering the mysteries of science that have eluded us to this point and ultimately improving the lives of uh, people throughout the world. And it is all these considerations that are encapsulated within the NIH research grant that I'm going to discuss today. I would just say that in my experience, the reason grant writing is so difficult for investigators is because scientists have not considered many of these important aspects of the research in the first place. Um, the corollary of that, or, or the flip side of that, is the people who have thought a lot of, about how to communicate the research, its rationale and significance, the impact it has, they find grant writing fairly easy because that is what the grant contains at the heart of it. Framing your thinking about your research will greatly uh, further your academic career by showing you how to communicate with your colleagues 
at medical congresses, how to write an accepted peer review manuscript, and a winning grant, whether it's from the NIH or the National Science Foundation, NSF, or other federal agencies, or from any of the hundreds of private foundations, such as the Gates Foundation or Howard Hughes Medical Institute, all of which fund millions of dollars of research each year. But it'll also advance your career uh, by funding and communicating your research in a way that not only stands out to those who listen to your lectures, but also to your colleagues who read what you have written in your field. So let me begin with that background. Uh, a corollary of, of what I just said is writing is extremely important, writing and communicating. You know, a foundation in science and medical research is very, uh, is essential, is very important. Uh, and that is what your training has, has given you. But equally important and often ignored and not taught is clear writing. Disorganized and sloppy writing is interpreted by reviewers as disorganized thinking and sloppy research. I used to be um, an uh, a editor for the senior um, editor for JAMA, or the Journal of American Medical Association. I can tell you that no matter how good the research is, if the paper is poorly put together, is sloppy, it is, reflects very badly uh, on, on the person who submitted it. And the success or failure of your academic position is directly linked to clearly communicating the science in both written and oral formats. So do understand, even though it may be obvious, that your grant or your manuscript is the only representation of your work to those who matter, the reviewers and editors. So this is extremely important uh, to, to understand um, in the consideration of writing a grant, but in general, your career as well. So my mantra for a grant, or what they call a grantsmanship, is there really is no grantsmanship or ability to write a good grant that will turn a bad scientific idea into a good one. But there are many ways to disguise a good scientific idea. And this is the heart of what I'm gonna to present today, is how not to disguise it. Very important. So I'll talk about what the NIH R01 grant is, the research grant. And I wanna, the, the bulk of my talk will be about the strategy for writing the grant. And then I'll talk a little bit about peer reviewers, uh, those who review your grants and their application and their points of uh, good grant writing. And a little bit about organizing uh, the grant and some aesthetics in writing. So first, the NIH, and some of you I'm sure know the NIH quite well, have uh, seen many of their websites. Uh, but those who don't, just let me introduce the NIH this way. It's the largest, largest public funder of medical research, biomedical research in the world, and it, it invests over $32 billion a year uh, in research to enhance life and reduce illness and disability. And the NIH uh, has funded research that have led to breakthrough in new treatments, helped people to live longer, healthier lives, and built the research foundation that drives discovery. And that last point is extremely important because not necessarily all NIH research is directly linked to health and human disease, but uh, it's also uncovering new discoveries in, in many different fields that, that drive research uh, forward. And um, for example, the National uh, Institute of General Medical Sciences, NIGMS, is an institute that, that does basic science in cellular and uh, cellular biology and molecular biology and many other fields, but not necessarily directly linked to disease. At the NIH, there are 27 institutes. Um, many of you know these institutes, the, the really familiar ones, the big, big ones are the National Cancer Institute, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, NHLBI, the uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, that is really, really uh, an important one, um, the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, NIDDK, 
the Institute of General Medical Sciences, I just mentioned, the National Institute of Mental Health, or NIMH, and the National Institute of Neurological Diseases and Stroke, NINDS. Those are the big tickets uh, at the NIH. There's uh, quite a few others, uh, all of which have their own flavor. And I would say that if you are specifically interested in particular institute uh, in a field of research that you uh, would like to uh, uh, look at, go to that institute or center on in the in, you know on the NIH website, and each one is different. It has its own mission, their own budgets, their own activities, their ways of doing things. It's a very individual personality. In other words, the NIH uh, uh, Institute websites are not uniform. They're all very different. And before you would submit a grant, it is extremely important that you would check with any program directors from the institutes to determine their policies and interest in your science. That is probably the most vital piece of information I can give you because I have worked with many, many investigators. I was on the faculty at Dartmouth and at Stanford University, and I've worked with investigators on their grants, and I have seen them write a grant for a specific institute, submit it, and have it rejected, saying, well, this is not the kind of grant that we fund. You should have checked with us first. Uh, you know, the, the NCI does not fund this, but NIM, GMS or, or uh, NIDDK might be interested. So it's very important that you first check with program directors. Um, the R01 um, is the granddaddy. It's sort of the original and historically the oldest grant mechanism used by the NIH to support research and development. It has what they call parent announcements, and I won't go into this too much, but the parent announcement means that um, it's, it's an unsolicited um, grant. In other words, it's not solicited by the NIH. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, they have a specific PA number, and you can type this into Google, PA18484, and, and get the announcement and read it, one in which no clinical trial or one in which clinical trial is required. So uh, there are two different um, announcements. This particular type of grant supports new grants, any renewals, resubmissions, or revisions whereas other R grants don't allow that. For example, the R03, and I'm not going to talk a lot about that, is a small research grant for only two years and about $50,000, and it does not support any of those, just the new grant. The R01 will pay somewhere the order of $500,000 per year in direct cost. For a four-year grant, that equals $2 million. That's a lot of money um, to, to run a research project. Uh, this is a bit of a mixed bag here, uh, this grant, this, this graph. Um, these are research project grants, uh, RPGs, uh, for all institutes and centers. So it's not only the R01, but the R03, the R21, the R34, there's a, a, a slew of the R grants. So this shows success rates, how many grants were submitted, how many were accepted. And overall, all institutes, all 27 institutes for all years from 19, 2008 to 2017 is about 16.5% uh, success rate. And, that, and the success rates, as an average, have gone down and then come back up in the in most recent years. Uh, I think in 2018, the number is closer to 16.5. But it's a bit elusive because this is all research project grants for all institutes. And if you were to look at R01 grants, success rates for, say, the National Institute um, or the National Cancer Institute, it would be 8%, pretty low. Whereas the National Institute of General Medical Sciences is more like about 18%. They vary quite a bit. And that for a lot of reasons. And so average of all is about 16.5%. That means that uh, an awful lot of grants don't get accepted. And I guess my point of the slide is, if you want to assure a success rate in a field that is very, very highly competitive, um, 
you have to know how to write the grant in a way that's going to get uh, the reviewer's attention and um, be successful in, in presentation. Um, our grants, uh, whether they be R21s, which is a um, innovative uh, research grant, or R03, a small grant, or an R01, they're all receipt um, the fifth of the month of February, June, and October. In four months past that, a review, and four months past that, a start date. So, um, if it's a renewal, resubmission, or revision, uh, the dates are different. But these are for new applications. So there are three times during the year that you can submit an R grant. And in an R grant, the organization is shown here. There are 16 different specific uh, parts to the grant. And um, it's a very large, it's a very large document. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, sections two and three, which are really, in my view, the heart of the grant. And uh, the introduction is really used only for resubmission uh, to uh, resubmit a, a grant for a specific reason. But the specific aims in the research strategy are really the heart of the grant. And I'm going to talk about those um, exclusively. When the NIH um, uh, reviews and scores your grant, they use five criteria. Um, and I'm going to talk about at least three of these that are important. We'll, we'll touch on all five. The relevance to human health and disease, um, uh, that's the significance. The innovation is how original your approach is. Uh, the approach criteria is the feasibility of your methods. Will it answer the aims? Will they be feasible? You, your investigator, P PI training and experience, and the environment, your, your institution, suitability of your facilities and adequacy of support from your specific institution. And the overall impact score, uh, which is from one to nine, um, for example, and it's, it's, um, it scores that run from 10 to 90, um, a 10 being the best and 90 being the worst, is overall reflects the likelihood for a project to exert a sustained and powerful influence on the research field is involved in consideration of these criteria and others. Um, there are often other cri criteria, but these are the main five. And um, th this is NIH's uh, wording, the likelihood for, for this research to, to exert a powerful sustained influence on the research field. This is very important that you think in a very high way about your research in terms of these things, because if if you could not stand in, a, in an elevator talking to a colleague and saying, Bill, uh, tell me a little bit about your research and really hit the significance, what, why it's innovative, how you're going to do it, uh, and more importantly, what impact it'll have, uh, then you really have no business writing a grant or even giving a talk about the research you're doing because these are, these are important aspects of your research. So impact is the word that, that I like to focus on because the impact and priority score will reflect the reviewer's judgment of two broad concepts, importance and likelihood. The first one, is the significance and innovation of the research problem, its ability to move the field forward. Um, the second one, likelihood, is the ability that you, the principal investigator, can achieve your ends as judged by the design of your experiment, the expertise of your team, what resources you have, not only in your lab, but at your institution uh, to execute the project successfully and your past successes, which are reflected in the grant. It's reflected in, in many different parts of the grant, and I'll talk a little bit about where, where that is shown. And at a 50,000-foot view, your overall impact score really is, is my research important or significant to human health and disease? Plus, can I do it? And am I qualified to do it? Plus, will it have a significant impact on the field? Those are the three big areas that I would say um, the NIH is looking for. 
the biosketch, which is uh, your your curriculum vitae in a sense, but it's in a new form. Uh, actually, they changed it a few years ago. This is a place where you get scored for principal investigator, including your background, what grants and publications you've produced uh, that are relevant to your proposal, your track record, your overall training and experience. And there's a personal statement that goes in these. And um, I can't tell you how irritating it has been for me over my career to see um, investigators paste personal statements in every single biosketch for every different grant that they that they put forth. Every single grant has a different different personal statement about their role and their ability to carry out this research in this particular grant. So. Um, Every biosketch, in fact, is going to be re unique to some extent, even though your background's the same. The abstract that goes with the grant uh, has two parts. What's, one's called the project summary, which is really the abstract. It's a succinct and accurate description. Uh, it's informative to other persons working in the same field uh, or related fields, uh, and for a, t a technically literate reader. It's about 30 lines of text. The project narrative is the second component that defines relevance. And the way that NIH describes it is they say, no more than two to three sentences describe the relevance of this research to human health. And this is used uh, by Congress, so it's written in plain language. And it's two to three sentences. In a little while in the lecture, I'm going to talk to you about using uh, the NIH reporter, which is probably the most powerful tool you can learn, um, to pull up various abstracts um, from funded research. And I recommend that you maybe pull up a few in your field and read the project narratives that are in them um, of the funded research, because I think it'll show you how the investigator has thought through the relevance of the, the research to public health. It's, it's, it's quite um, important, and I think this is one of the things that um, most reviewers read when they, when they get the grant. So the specific aims, uh, this is really the heart of the research grant. What do I intend to accomplish and why is it worth funding? And uh, one of my mentors at Stanford, Alan Reese, um, who runs a huge um, a research lab, and I used to be his grant person there, um, used to tell me most reviewers will read only the aims in the abstract and make up their minds about their proposal. Then they'll look to the detail of your proposal to support their opinion. But It'll be window dressing for them if they are not excited or think that this has much merit. So I would say that the specific aims is probably the most important part of your grant. And the NIH asks for this, and this is their language right out of the instructions, the, the SF-424 instructions. State concisely the goals of the proposed research and summarize the expected outcomes. And I underline this part is, including the impact that the results of the proposed research will exert on the research field as well. I find it incredulous that this is written in the instructions and I used to get uh, pages of specific aims from researchers that completely missed that. So this is really, really, really important, this last part. Then it says, list the, the objectives. These are the aims. Are you testing a, a stated hypothesis? In almost every case, you will be. Are you creating a novel design? Are you solving a specific problem? Are you challenging a paradigm or clinical practice? Are you addressing a critical barrier to progress in the field or developing a new technology? And you may be doing every single one of those six items. But it helps to have this in front of you when you're writing your aims. Just to keep, keep, your, uh, keep the framework in front of you so that you know that you're, I mean, you, you can use those exact words. You are going to be writing a hypothesis. You are using a novel design, hopefully, um, and, and you're, you're, you're stating the specific problem. But these are what the NIH asks for. So there are four paragraphs to the, um, 
to, to the aims. And uh, that could be debated. Uh, however, I can tell you the NIH has vetted my slides and they certainly agree with it. So I would say most every investigator I've worked with follows this formula. First of all, you want to immediately define the problem or the critical need uh, that you're addressing and the gaps in knowledge that you're filling. This is a short background leading up to the stated problem and knowledge gap, the need. The second paragraph shows you how to fill that need, the solution to the stated problem by proposing hypotheses. The third paragraph are your aims, your objectives that test that hypothesis and address the critical need. And the fourth is probably the most important paragraph and the one that is most often botched or excluded uh, is the payoff. So the NIH is gonna give you $2 million. Tell me how it's gonna help research. What do you expect to find? And that leads to impact in the field. And I will say, uh, is it addressing an NIH need? So I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but the NIH is looking for research um, that is filling some of their interests, not necessarily yours. And um, there are quite a few requests for applications or program announcements that the NIH puts out for, in each institute that they say, we are interested in, in, in finding out the answer to these problems, or this is an area of research we want to be funding. Um, I mean, you may be putting in an unsolicited grant, which means it's your research, but it's very important that you look first to see if it aligns in any way, shape, or form to the NIH interests. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but that's very important to the NIH. And the impact. What is the probability your study will be successful and exert a powerful, sustained influence on the field um, in, in, a, in a specific and maybe more general way? And, you know, if it won't work, if your study, you know, is not successful, it'll have no impact, even if it has a high significance. In other words, it's an important study. Um, so the important last paragraph ad addresses the expected outcomes, if it's an NIH need, and what is the impact. And that, that, th those sentences are probably some of them among the most important parts in, an, in, a, in a specific AIMS page. So essentially, the first paragraph of the AIMS goes into what don't we know, uh, what, what do we know, and what don't we know, and what gap in knowledge is there between those two things? What is the unmet medical need? What is, what is, what is the gap to, uh, of knowledge? And that is the basis for your project. That's an oversimplification, but it's really at a very fundamental level. That is exactly what they want to know. So the first paragraph, um, I don't like to think of uh, writing a grant or a paper as fiction. Um, although in many cases I think I've read some fiction, um, you need to hook your reader just like you would need to hook an editor of a novel. In the very first sentence, what is known, what's unknown, leading to the gap? And many investigators, unfortunately, fall into the trap of framing the problem of few studies have been done uh, or there's not a lot of research that has been published, or that the disease itself is the problem. It's really the gap in knowledge for diagnosing or treating the disease at, you know, uh, at the NIH is most fundamental level. So, for example, for a grant to the diabetes and digestive and kidney diseases, NIDDK, on wound healing, okay, you would not write something like, little research has been done, there is need for additional work, no publications have been examined, the reasons for, et cetera. The NIH doesn't want to read this. They also don't want to read an introduction on wound healing to type 2 diabetes affects more than 12% of the population, responsible for 100,000 deaths and $1 million in direct health care costs, et cetera, et cetera. 
it isn't um, the problem. The problem is is different for us. For example, um, for a request for application by the NIDDK on wound healing might look like this. And excuse me for reading this, but I think it's important to get the flavor of this. The cellular and molecular mechanisms underpinning tissue repair and failure of wounds to heal are poorly understood still, and current therapies are limited because of that. Poor wound healing after trauma, surgery, acute illness, or uh, chronic disease conditions affects millions worldwide every year, and the consequences of poorly regulated elements of healthy tissue repair response, including inflammation, angiogenesis, matrix de deposition, and cell recruitment. Failure of one or several of these processes linked to an underlying clinical condition, such as vascular disease, diabetes, or aging, which are all frequently associated with healing pathologies. The search for clinical strategies that would improve the body's repair mechanisms is needed to be based on an understanding of the biology of wound repair and regeneration, the central goal of this research. Now, that may be a little general, but it captures the flavor of um, tell me what we do and don't know and sort of where the gap is and why it's important to fill that gap. So that's what you need to focus on in paragraph one. So, for example, if it's a, if it's a grant uh, identifying lymph node metastases in patients with resectable lung cancer, you would not write in the first sentence, lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death among men and women in the United States. In 2008, 109,643 men were diagnosed with lung cancer, and 88,329 died. In addition, 98,893 women, et cetera, et cetera. You don't want to read that. This is not something that is important. If the focus of the grant is identifying metastases in the lymph in patients with resectable lung cancer, because it states the obvious, it's not focused about the grant. It doesn't tell you what the grant is about. You want to read something more like this, failure to identify regional lymph node metastases in 40,000 U.S. patients a year with surgically resected lung cancer is associated with, three, with a three-fold increase in cancer recurrence and decreased overall survival. Our research will develop model me uh, novel methods to identify and treat lymph node metastases. This is focused on the problem of the grant and identifies it, and it relates to the, uh, and, and hopefully will, will relate to the uh, mission of the agency. This was actually taken from a grant to the National Cancer Institute. The second paragraph of your specific aims is solution to the stated problem uh, in, in filling the gap leading, leading to your aims. And it, it must be hypothesis based. So, what is your objective with a specific application addressing the critical need? Are you developing a map of wound microenvironment leading to biomarkers of healing status? I mean, what is the objective? You should also state what sort of is a long-term goal that you identify. You might want to say, I, we're developing effective biomarkers of wound healing and identify treatments that target each. Um, your research is not in a vacuum. It's a continuum. And so, Five years from now, you're hopefully going to be thinking about what you're, what, where you're going with this. So um, the second paragraph should uh, state a hypothesis of, 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 of your research. It, it's compatible, of course, with all known facts and evidence that you presented. It's very specific and it's testable. So your aims will test it. And you can write it in the form of we hypothesize that or a specific aim one could say to test the hypothesis that, but I like the first one. To just state the hypothesis, and it should be formulated through existing literature in your preliminary findings. What you already know, what you found, and what, what has been found by others. The third paragraph for the specific aims, as I mentioned, they must be based on hypotheses or they're testing the hypothesis that you've stated. They address the problem and fill the gap that you've identified in paragraph one. They are specific. I don't wanna be uh, glib about this, but I mean, a lot of uh, aims I've read are not specific. 
They must be measurable and doable in the time frame of the grant. One of the biggest reasons grants fail is that they are overly ambitious. The reviewers like what they read, they think it's a really significant problem, but it's too ambitious. So they'll say, well, they'll never get there. There's no way in four years or five years they'll get to that point. So that's important. And um, I don't say these things in a vacuum. I've read many, many uh, grants uh, that have aims that start out like to study the effects of, to explore the reasons for, to better understand, to investigate the causes, uh, you know, to research why. This is vague and nonspecific. You, you would never want to write that. Your specific aim should see, say something like this measure levels of calcium and magnesium in the wound microenvironment over 21 days in an established rodent wound healing model. Something of that nature It's very specific. It's measurable, it's specific, and you then go on to describe very briefly how you are going to do that. The fourth paragraph, which I said is the most important, are what are my expected outcomes and what is the probability my study will be successful and then exert a sustained influence on the fields? And uh, specifically, more generally, that's the impact. So this is the NIH payoff. Why should they give you money for this research? They want to know these things. It's very important that you tell them accurately. The expected outcomes must be specific and credible and because it's, it, it's the return on investment for the NIH. And you would not write, this is what we believe we will have accomplished, but we expect to determine. You have to be strong, direct, present tense. And how will these stated outcomes fill the need and thereby advance research and the mission of the agency, if possible? Um, it's very important that you write a, an impact statement that is credible, specific enough for, the, for them to believe you, uh, and that you've really thought through how it's going to impact research in the future. So a little bit about what this word impact means. It, it's the likelihood or probability for the project to exert the, its powerful influence. The likelihood is derived from you, the investigator, your approach, what you've found already, and the environment that you're using. So that's like, they're, you know, they're pretty likely to find the answer to this and get, get in, information that's useful. Um, this sustained powerful influence is derived also, uh, uh, is derived from the significance and innovation that you stated in your grant. And the research fields that you refer to may vary. So be clear on what specific fields you believe are influenced by your project. It could be very specific. For example, if you're studying um, autism um, disorder, but in general, you're studying other childhood uh, disorders with, with, with uh, brain uh, disorganization, such as Klinefelter syndrome or Turner's or something of that nature, it could also be more general for those conditions or other fields. So it's very important that you think about what research fields are involved in, in, in your research. So if you, if you go back and you look at the specific aims page, it, 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 it looks like this at a very high level. What is the problem? What is the gap in knowledge, the critical need that we're addressing? What is the proposed solution, hypothesis? What are my aims? What are my objectives? And what are my expected outcomes and impact and long-term goals? And this feeds directly back to the knowledge gap and critical need that you stated in paragraph two or paragraph one. So, um, that, that's kind of a, a, a capture of what the AIMS page should look like. And now I'll give you a wording uh, from an actual grant um, that I think captures these things. First is these uh, titles that are in uh, gold letters are not part of the grant, but I put them there just to show you what parts I've been discussing. Screening for colon cancer includes screening colonoscopies for everyone over 50, but they're expensive and invasive. 
screening for occult blood and stool is inexpensive but ineffective and many cancers are missed. A blood test that could accurately detect colon cancer very early would save lives. Um, I've truncated this to some extent, but it gives you the flavor. This actually was a grant that eventually led to the production of um, Cologuard, which is a very popular um, colon cancer screening test, um, even though it doesn't use blood. Okay, what are the gaps in knowledge? Current approaches for measuring proteins in blood are relatively inexpensive and insensitive and unlikely to detect cancers early. Human variability and low signal means many independent patient samples must be measured. What is our solution? New proteomic technologies developed by my group both offer sensitivity and throughput needed to identify and validate blood biomarkers for early detection. We hypothesize that colon cancers can be more effectively detected using sensitive biomarkers. And then this is where they list the aims. And I'm not going to read this, but they're very, very specific. To identify plasma proteins associated with early stages, to carry out a bioinformatic analysis of overrepresented proteins for enrichment of specific functions, and to select and validate candidate biomarkers. Um, the one point I'm making with this slide is to notice how short the description is of each one of these aims. The biggest mistake I've seen in writing a specific aims page, and by the way, it's only one page, 11 point type with one half inch margins, is that they give way too much detail under each aim. And th this needs to be short, one or two sentences at the most. So, so that it doesn't, um, while it gives the flavor, it does not have to give all the detail of each aim, how they're going to uh, accomplish it. And here's the end, the end uh, paragraph. The end product of this research will be an affordable, accurate blood test for early detection of colon cancer without colonoscopy. Our approach will use many previously selected methods, see our preliminary studies in the grant, to increase the probability of success. Successful demonstration of this project in colon cancer will enable application to other cancers in need of early detection biomarkers. Future directions also include the application of assistance biology approach to the large data sets generated in our discovery phase that will provide new insights about the earliest stages of colon cancer. Developing such a novel treatment for colorectal cancer directly addresses one National Cancer Institute provocative question and is a central mission of the National Institute of Di uh, Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. So um, I'm not going to go into what those are, but this shows that they have looked up requests for applications from these institutes or on the strategy page of these institutes, it's actually been stated. So it's very important that you include that if it is directly linked to any, any institute um, uh, request for proposals or uh, uh, their, their mission. Uh, that's, that's vital, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Most of the problems with the aims that are seen uh, in uh, review are that, first of all, they're just lack of original or innovative ideas, um, that they're unrealistic or unfocused. Um, that's a real big one because many of, that I've seen just aren't focused, clearly focused, and they aren't realistic. Um, there are too many risks. There are risks. They need to be justify why it's important to pursue and how knowledge would move the field forward if the aim wasn't met. Um, they are poorly justified. So the relationship to what is known and what is unknown is not obvious. It's got to be obvious. And in a lot of times, um, they are hypothesis-driven. Uh, they're purely descriptive. And the reviewers uh, on certain review uh, forums have come back with statements like this. This proposal looks more like a collection of experiments in which the applicant are simply listing experience according to their expertise in specific techniques instead of testing an underlying hypothesis or our enthusiasm was dampened by a lack of hypothesis driven by a specific mechanism. 
Other problems, lack of cohesiveness, the, you know, the aims have to be thematically related and form a unit, which would be unified by a central hypothesis. Or that one aim is dependent upon the other. So if aim one is not met, you couldn't go to aim two. So you want to avoid interdependent of the aims unless there is no doubt that the early goal will be achieved. That's really important. Um, describing techniques is a problem. Um, too many details, as I mentioned. And then also I've mentioned this. In, in an R01 uh, four-year grant, two to four aims. If you're doing a small grant, R03 or R21 is one to two aims. Otherwise, it'll give the reviewer the impression is unfocused. And, um, you know, it, it's very important that you avoid trying to make this thing way too ambitious. I've seen even R01 grants with three or four aims, and then as they went into the approach, they listed sub-aim 1, sub-aim 1B, sub-aim 1C, 1D, 1E. It went on and on, and by the time I finished reading it, it was over 16 aims. So I said, well, the reviewers are just not going to find this doable. It's too ambitious. And then the other one is, is seems obvious, but it, it's there's, that there's no significant impact on the field. Uh, that hasn't been stated clearly, that you really haven't thought through what that impact will be. Um, if you don't believe me, uh, here's an annual, annual of internal medicine study that um, showed that of uh, 66 grants submitted to the NIH, almost half uh, had overstated goals. Uh, they were overly ambitious. They were unrealistic. 38% were poorly focused, uh, inadequately conceptualized, and half had no clear hypothesis. So that's really important that um, you, you, you know, that you don't overstate your goals, you're, you're, you're um, realistic, it's not too ambitious, it's clearly hypothesized, and uh, it's focused. That, that's extremely important. The rest of the part of the grant that I mentioned earlier is the research strategy, which is significance, innovation, and approach, those three sections. And the approach includes the preliminary studies. And in every R01 grant, um, because an R01 is usually submitted by a more established investigator, it's not a grant for a brand new investigator. If you're a postdoc and you say, well, I want to get money for my research, uh, but I don't have a great deal of uh, preliminary studies, that would not be the grant to go for. Um, so preliminary studies are a part, of, big part of this grant. So that goes under the approach. So I'm going to talk about each of these specific areas. First of all, uh, significance. Why is my work important? And the NIH asks in this very language for the, the, the three things. Explain the importance of the problem or the critical barrier to the progress in the field that you're addressing, and I mentioned that. So this is really kind of the heart of what, 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 you know, what is the importance of this problem? Uh, how will the proposed project improve scientific knowledge, technical capability, or clinical practice? in one or more broad fields. And this speaks a little bit, this in three, speak more to the impact. Describe how the concepts, methods, technologies, treatments, services, or preventative interventions that drive this field will be changed if the proposed aims are achieved. So they want to know, how is it going to be innovative and change some of these paradigms and ways of doing things, um, how you deliver uh, how, how a method is done or, you know, a new technology or a new treatment or service, uh, how is that going to change uh, if, if you achieve your aims? Um, the biggest problems with the significance is, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll only repeat it because it's happened so many times, you don't want to argue that a particular illness is significant. That states the obvious. The significance is what you will do to overcome the problems in diagnosis or treatment. And that, you know, it's just low impact research. It's just incremental. Uh, it's confirmatory. It's duplicative. I mean, it's obviously this has got to be something new, something that you're addressing that has not been looked at before, um, it, that high, high significance. Now, the innovation, which uh, is the second part of the uh, research strategy, is probably the most problematic for almost investigators because they don't understand what it is. And I'm going to try to clear that up. First of all, these are the three things right out of the instructions of the NIH, NIH instructions, the SF-424. 
explain how the explication challenges and seeks to shift current research or clinical practice paradigm. Describe any novel theoretical concepts, approaches, methods, instrumentation, interventions to be developed or used, and any advantage over existing methodologies, instrumentation, or interventions. So there, it's important that if you are proposing something innovative, something new, you're doing something different, a new, a new, a new um, method, or a new instrument, or a new intervention, that you describe why you're using it and what um, advantage do you think this is going to have over current interventions or instrumentation or methods. And then the third thing is explain refinements, improvements, or new applications of theoretical concepts, approaches, or methodologies, instrumentation, or interventions. Okay, so um, that may not clear it up for, for people who are listening to this, but uh, I would recommend that you go on, uh, and I'll show you in a minute how to get there, to the NIAID website, and there are actual full grant applications, and you should read innovation sections to see how people uh, describe uh, how, why their research is innovative. You, you need to understand what innovation means for an NIH grant application and what the reviewers are looking for. So it's important to realize that research does not necessarily have to create a brand new paradigm. It can be uh, shifting a current paradigm uh, slightly. It can offer new combination of known methods leading to a new perspective. It can refine an existing model or technology. So it, 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 it um, and also it's important to realize that it's less risky to use an innovative approach to solve an existing problem than to take on a problem that's highly innovative. It can be hard to gain acceptance by the reviewers if your ideas are outside the mainstream, especially if you're left, less experienced. If your proposal is highly innovative, you'll need to make a strong case for why you're challenging the existing paradigm and have data that support that. Um, one of the things that uh, is important for the NIH is if you're suggesting something novel, something new, a new way of doing something, a new way of looking at something, that you may bring in consultants, many different consultants that will help you with, the, with uh, expertise that you don't, you don't have. That's, that's important. Um, but because innovation is a review criterion, you want to show how you will break new ground. So, so it's a kind of a balance. Um, the last part is how you're going to do this research. What have I already found? These are your preliminary studies, and how will I accomplish my specific aims? So this is the NIH wording out of the SF-424. What is the strategy, methods, analysis you're going to use to accomplish the aims? How will you collect, analyze, and interpret your data, and as well as any research sharing plans as appropriate? And then they want you to address any potential problems alternative strategies and benchmarks for success anticipated to achieve the aims. This is important um, because if you don't recognize that there could be uh, pitfalls in your research and how you would get around that, it, it doesn't uh, appear that you've thought it through. Um, and especially if the project's in the early stages of development, you want to describe any strategy to establish feasibility and address high, uh, management of the high-risk uh, aspects of the work. And again, the ways you would do that is to use a lot of consultants that have expertise in the field um, and details on how you're going to um, establish uh, feasibility of doing this work. It, it, you have to convince them that you can do it. They're not going to give you money on some vague notion that they think, well, he might be able to get there, but it's important that they are feeling very confident you're going to accomplish that aim. Um, so the approach would contain such things as your preliminary studies or progress report, they call them on all, uh, as well, uh, your study design, your study strategy, your experimental approach, so experiments to address each aim, and, and they're listed by aim. So you have to list, um, unless there are, are, are common methods that you're going to use in every aim but every aim will have a specific strategy. So experiments that will address each aim, 
and I would re really uh, recommend that you think visually and thinking about tables, figures to illustrate complex experiments with multiple arms of repetition under different conditions, for example. I'll give you an example of how I use that in one of the grants I helped to write, and that's right here. So this is a grant that was out of Dartmouth, uh, got funded as an R01 um, about um, uh, uh, addressing the problem of MRSA, of methicillin resistant um, step, step. And um, this investigator was doing a five lab, uh, it was a multi-PI uh, study, and there are five labs involved. And um, he wrote three pages of very complex um, methodology of workflow among the five collaborating environment, uh, laboratories. And I said, we're going to reduce this down to one page with a diagram. And I, I put together a diagram with him. And while we wrote the, put together the diagram, it clarified his thinking about how he's going to accomplish this. And that really was useful by just simply diagramming it. So we came up with this diagram with numbers, and each number corresponded to uh, a step in the, in, in, in the method. So it was uh, judged on review by the NIH as not only they're using in each lab tried and tested and published result, I mean, methods, but this um, series of, of uh, workflow, this, this workflow and this, in the way this, these, these compounds would go through each lab was very unique and innovative. So they viewed it as highly innovative this has never been done before, but it's being done by lab. The flow has never been done, but it's being done by labs that are that are um, that have tested their methods. So this got very high marks. Um, the the approach, and I recommend that you think about doing this when you're writing anything involving research, is to diagram it. Um, also, as I mentioned in the approach, you want to put in pitfalls and alternative approach. You know, what are your roadblocks? If you don't see the weak points, then um, reviewers think your approach is careless and less likely to succeed. And if you're a new stage PI uh, or early stage PI, um, I mentioned that only established PIs, but if you're early in your established career, Strategy to establish the feasibility with the methods. A new investigator is given leeway with some aspects of grant, but such as preliminary data, but not with the approach, anticipated results, and lack of plans for possible problems. So that's important to remember. Um, common errors in this area is um, too much detail. So what happens, um, as you know, I don't know how many years ago, what, 10 years ago, they changed the grant from 25 pages to 12. Um, that upset a great deal of investigators because they said, well, there's no way in God's green earth I can write an R01 research strategy in 12 pages. Well, trust me, people learned how to do it. And what happens, though, is starting with a blinking cursor, which is something you should never do, uh, getting through the approach, say, three-quarters of the way and say, oh, my God, I only have one and a half more pages that I can put in here and four more diagrams, and I can't get to the last aim. So they start truncating the information, and the grant looks like a patchwork of lots of information, less information, and just, deep, you know, outlined information. So I'm going to tell you to outline your grant at, at the end of this lecture, but the, la the level of detail um, should be consistent, and it should be proportional to the novelty of the method. Standard techniques should not have a lot of detail. You can reference or show that in preliminary studies. Feasibility of each aim is not shown, so listing your experiments without tying them to the aims will just stop your grant. It'll just kill it. The research is not targeted to NIH interest. Uh, there's a lack of pitfalls and alternative approaches. You've got to include those. You know, being able to propose alternative approaches if your aims uh, or your plans fails, it, it scores big with reviewers. They want to see that. 
Overly ambitious, as I mentioned. This is not a wish list for experiments that you think are impressive. If the studies are not achievable in the time frame of the grant, this may become future work, but you don't propose work that is clearly uh, more than four years. So the, the overall impact score you get at a 50,000 foot view is, why is my research important? Plus, can I do it? Am I qualified to do it? And will it have a significant impact on the field? And that I said before is really what the bottom line is uh, for a reviewer looking at your research. And now I get to the point that I made earlier. Uh, Jane Scott, a program officer at the National Heart and Lung uh, Blood Institute, said what reviewer, uh, the, the, the reason for a reviewer's lack of enthusiasm on a grant is often that it does not address the primary scientific mission or interest of the funding agency. And people say, well, I'm submitting an unsolicited grant. Of course it wouldn't. Well, but it should. It should, and I'm going to show you how to, how to look at that. Unfortunately, a lot of investigators uh, haven't been shown how to do this. The grant targets the NIH. So on the specific games page, significant and approach, you want to use specific language such as, our proposal addresses three objectives of the National Cancer Institute request for application CA-15008. Now, this may be, in, a, in other words, you would be directly applying for that RFA. Or these specific aims address two objectives of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. Namely, the research is in direct response to the NIH brain uh, strategic initiative. So uh, it's really important that you tie it to what the NIH is looking for. Okay, and there's three ways to do this. The first is each institute has stated research priorities. They also have requests for funding and program announcements, RFAs and PAs. And I said earlier, the NIH Reporter is a tool, online tool that show you what has been funded. So first, let's take a look at, here's the NIH, uh, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, a uh, huge, huge NIH agency. And within there, here are the funding areas, heart, lung, blood, sleep, sickle cell disease, implementation science, et cetera, et cetera. If you click on any one of those, it'll show you a whole list of research priorities, funding areas that they're interested in. These are not RFAs. These are not requests for applications, but areas that they are interested in. Any investigator who is submitting work to the NIH must read this first so that they can align what they're doing with some of the work that the NIH is doing or they're interested in. Here's one from the uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Areas of study. It, it's amazing to me that a lot of investigators never even look at this. So HIV AIDS, infectious diseases, allergy, immunology, and transplantation, et cetera. There, these are general, but within each one of these is a, a specific list of things that they are interested in funding. That's very important that you know that. RFAs, requests for funding, requests for application. So if you go to the National Cancer Institute and you click on grants and training, you will get this, okay? You'll see uh, areas like research grant funding, funding for training, cancer moonshot funding, latest uh, announcements. And you should go through all of those sections if you're submitting, say, a cancer-related uh, that you think would be directly related to the uh, to the NCI, and you may find that it isn't, but related directly to the NCI, and read what the RFAs are, okay, and read uh, what sort of areas they're interested in funding, because this gives gives you a, a you know direct insight into what they're looking for. As I mentioned, the NIH reporter. If you type in NIH reporter in Google, you'll find it, and the um, query page looks like this. It's what they used to call the CRISP database, which was a very poor version of this. This is an extremely powerful tool. You can search all funded uh, NIH, and, and I believe there are other uh, federal agency um, uh, uh, funded um, uh, grants. They're, they're funded. And you can look at it by research and organization. You can look at by a string of text. 
uh, Logic Text using Andor. You can look under uh, app application number if you have if you happen to have that. You can look at and the, the one I have circled in red here is important. You can look at it by agency. You can look at it by funding mechanism. Only R01s, only training grants, only uh, uh, career awards, whatever they might be. You can also, at the very bottom there, it says study section. You can find every study section for every inst at, at the NIH and look at what they fund. So if you know that your grant may be likely looked at it for a specific study section, look up and see what they've already funded. It'll give you a clue as to what they're interested in. That's very important. The other thing that you should do is go to the NIA ID, and here's the website. And there they give you sample applications for R01s, which is the full application and the summary statement. Um, here are three of them. They also show um, R21s and I think career awards. Okay, I'm gonna talk at the very end here about some very well-known peer reviewers <laughs> Uh, that are institutions who uh, have m spent many years reviewing grants. And here is some of their advice. The most common error, particularly with new investigators, is overambitiousness, covering too much territory with the time allotted. This is Keith Yanomoto. He's the chair of uh, the University of California uh, School of Medicine. And um, this is probably one of the most big, the biggest problems that grants fail, overly ambitious. Okay, Martin Filbert at University of Michigan. If you do not immediately convey the essence of the idea clearly, then no matter how good the idea, it's lost. Convey clearly and repetitively what you want to do, why it's important, and how it will advance the science. Okay, and 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 if you if in two or three uh, sentences you cannot convey that, then you you have to really go back and rethink what your research is about. It's very important to be able to answer those questions. And this is the one I like the most. David Granger at the University of Utah said, you can read many proposals, but one stands out as being a wonderful piece of writing. For me, these contain a lucid style, a compelling scientific creative idea, and especially this idea of impact, moving the science forward towards a clinical end that is credible with a boost of capability to a patient population with an unmet need. And I think that succinctly describes what the impact is. And that has to be extremely clear in your proposal. Brian Hoffman at Northwestern University says, if you have a bunch of peer reviewers looking at your proposal, they wanna find an exciting idea in good science that is supported, so tell them a good story. They're interested in reading what you have to say. Now, here are some grant reviewers. Uh, they will be unnamed, but this is some of the things that they've said when they read, read proposals, and I've been among these. Psychological mechanisms came into play during the review of the grant. Once I lost patience for an applicant for writing disorganized section, I was much more likely to notice other faults. Once they, they hit a red flag, this is true, uh, and I can tell you from experience, of a, of a peer reviewer, um, uh, you know, at, at, a, at a journal uh, or, or, or a journal editor. Once they see problems, they're going to start seeing other faults. Also, when the proposal was sloppy, it was difficult not to extrapolate that to sloppy lab work. But at the other extreme, the easier the applicant made it for me to get the information necessary to assess the application, the more likely I was, if the science was sound, to have a positive feeling about the proposal. So how you write your proposal has a huge impact on how they review it. Here's another one. Bad organization could mislead the reviewer. If the topic sentence of uh, the paragraphs is full of unimportant ideas, I would move on to the next paragraph. This was sometimes detrimental for the applicant and it's embarrassing for me. What I learned from my peers that the important information had been buried in one of those part of paragraphs. And I'm going to tell you to outline your grant because this is how you get around that. Okay, so an outline is considering the grant as a unit to establish a logical progression from specific aim through approach. It'll eliminate any disorganized or illogical thought and poor transition. It'll eliminate redundancies and omissions. 
and it will provide with fixed points of a reference that reduce complex revisions and eliminates redu uh, redundancies. It'll force you to be brief, clear, and cohesive. If you start writing a grant and you haven't thought through clearly what you're going to say and you have no outline, I guarantee you 100% that you'll run into trouble with many of these things. It'll be too redundant. It'll have things that are missing. It will all be unclear. It will be overly clunky and very difficult to read, and it won't be cohesive. And these are all things that a grant must have to be, compete successfully. So I would just suggest that you like number the headings to help reviewers navigate, like 3.0, 3.1, but not 3.0.1.2.5. This is not a, well, it is a government document, but it's not written for NASA. Make, and make the consist, uh, headings consistent throughout. I mean, I've read many, many grants where I couldn't follow through the grant what the headings were and that they were inconsistent in terms of what level they were. Uh, when you want to emphasize something, don't bold it or uh, underline it. Probably don't italicize it either. Uh, worst of all, don't bold it, italicize or underline it in different ways in different places. That'll really confuse the reviewer. And I like my, uh, the person I learned to write grants from at Stanford told me, at the end of your paragraph, tell the reviewer in a very short little summary statement what you've just told them just to give them a summary. And again, tables of timelines, figures of approach help a great deal for the reviewers. What a reviewer or anybody sees versus what they read, they retain what they see much more often. Here's a picture of a grant uh, from a successful uh, grant and nicely laid out. So this helps also psychologically you can see that all the figures are in a box. The image, uh, the figure titles are, are within that box. It's very clear. Um, sometimes when I've seen grants where the, where, the, where the figures and the figure captions and the text were very, they were all mixed together. It's very difficult to read. So it's important that the grant be put together skillfully this way. If you don't know how to do this, find somebody that knows how to use Microsoft Word which is really unfortunately a tragedy because word is not made to do this. It will do it, but it's hard to do. So a last thing here, your grant will address a critical unmet need in medicine and one that the NIH wants to fund. Your grant has a high impact and it's very innovative, but it'll fail because your English is unclear, the spelling and punctuation has a bunch of, uh, are, are incorrect and the writing is sloppy. It's not clear, it's not concise or logical. So I would say that if, you, if writing is not your forte, um, get help with colleagues who are good writers or an editor who can help you clarify your thoughts. Um, that's really, really important. So remember that your grant, your paper, your poster, your PowerPoint presentation is often the only representation of your work that the critics and reviewers who fund your research, publish your finding, or judge your work will see. So, you know, it reflects directly on you how you put this together. This is probably the most important part. You can do years and years and years of great research, have great ideas, but if you don't communicate it clearly, it's lost. Or worse reflected badly upon you. Writing and communication is clearly the most valuable skill any scientist learn. If you learn how to communicate verbally, orally, and write well, you will uh, move up in your field because um, it's those that communicate clearly are the ones that um, I think are paid attention to the most. And the last thing is just a, a, a mention of my company, Medcom Consulting. I started this uh, about 18, 19 years ago. Um, after many years of work at universities, I was in industry for a while, I was at the government, it was at NASA and the Life Sciences Division. So what, what we do is original writing, editing, uh, and reviewing of NIH, and NSF, uh, NSF grants, whether they be research grant, career award, K grants, training grants, project grants. Um, 
I write and edit and um, put together peer-reviewed manuscripts, as well as abstracts, posters, and presentations at medical congresses. And we do long-term uh, research pl funding planning uh, through the NIH or private agencies. As I mentioned, you know, things like the National Cancer, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, um, the American Cancer Society, Alzheimer's Association, American Heart Association, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they all fund millions of dollars of research. And yet a lot of uh, proposals that come across my desk are not uh, put together for, ideally for that, for that agency or for the NIH. And that's what we do for, for, um, for investigators in uh, academia. And my email is medcomconsult at gmail.com if you're interested in uh, reaching me. And that concludes today's uh, lecture. Thank you. Dr. Dance, thank you for that informative presentation. Now we will start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. And if you, have, if you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. Dant, please do so now. Just click on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen and we'll, we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, Dr. Dant, our first question. Why did you mention R01 in the title? Won't these strategies apply for K's or other NIH grants? No, oh, great question. Um, I wanted to give a presentation generally about the research grant at the NIH, or the R grant. Um, there, as I mentioned, many different R grants, the R01 being the most common. But uh, first of all, these strategies in terms of the review criteria, uh, well, let me, let me back up. The, the review criteria for K grants or career uh, grants at the NIH are different, okay? They're not, not as I stated, for an R grant. Uh, K grants are, um, are, are training grants that um, are for postdoctoral fellows who want to receive a number of years of training, mentored, mentored training, uh, and their grant or K grant will have a very different um, uh, section which is describes the candidate's background and what they're going to be doing and what sorts of uh, weaknesses they have. It will have a research strategy. And a lot of the information I gave about research strategy um, uh, considerations, what's important, will apply to a K grant, but understand that a career award or a K grant is research training. and a different bent than research uh, grants. <coughs> Excuse me. So I don't know about other applications uh, that you're referring to. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, these applied generally to our grants, research grants at the NIH and not other grants, uh, such as training grants, uh, T grants, or program grants. Thank you, Dr. Dant. Now, could you comment on the use or avoidance of abbreviations? Well, any abbreviations or acronyms uh, in the grant should always be defined first use, any, any acronym, no matter how obvious they are. So it's important that uh, those are defined right up front. Um, I don't know what abbreviations the, the, um, uh, the individual is asking about specifically, but acronyms always are defined, first use. Um, so don't fill your application with a bunch of abbreviations and acronyms that the reviewers are going to stumble over. That'll be, that'll be a deal breaker. Dr. Dan, are, do you have any recommendations for early investigators trying to convert a K award into an R01? Well, this is the normal path, isn't it? Um, a, K, a K award, uh, first of all, you don't convert a K award into an R01. But during, uh, when you write your K grant, the obvious path is to, towards an R01. So during the um, discussion of your um, pathway in terms of becoming an independent investigator, 
you will refer to work that you plan to do after the training is finished, after you have completed the K award and you have completed your your research, how, what you uh, intend to, um, what direction you intend to go to in a K award. I'm sorry, an R01. So that usually is mentioned in the K award. Um, it's not converted. The only, um, well, it's not really a conversion. The only, um, uh, you know, kind of K award that is our sort of an R grant is the K99 R01, which is a very advanced K award. It's usually for people who have uh, very, very uh, highly experienced in the lab, um, not quite ready to write an R01. So they'll write a K99, which is uh, usually only three years of mentored training and then two years of doing actual research as an R00. And those are grants that um, are very prestigious. They're, they pay quite well um, and they're transferable. So somebody, for example, at Vanderbilt University came to Dartmouth when I was there and he came with a K99 R00. And um, he then wrote an R01, but he used the R00 portion uh, for two years to, you know, set up the lab and get things moving before his R01 was funded. Uh, recognize you don't, you know, want to wait the year before because these things sometimes take over a couple of years to get going. But um, the K, the, the K is, uh, the, you know, the pathway from a K is to an R01. So it's always mentioned. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Now, let's stick with the K99s. And for those K99 grants, what is the importance of preliminary studies? It's pretty important that you have some preliminary data because this is an advanced K award. And I didn't really intend for this lecture to be about career awards. But since you ask, it, 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 it is one of the most important uh, aspects of a, of a K99 is that you have preliminary studies. Usually a K99 recipient um, has done, you know, several years of research already, uh, usually through a T32 training grant or F, F grant, a fellowship or some other mechanism and has gained a fair amount of preliminary studies for their K. So their K99 already um, is advanced. They're saying, well, there's two or three uh, areas that are important uh, that I, I need training in, and here's what they are, and here's my plan to get that training, and here's my research that will also um, give me uh, a fair amount of uh, a background and training uh, to that end. But they have a preliminary study section in their uh, research strategy that, that has to be there. Uh, the same is true in R21. A lot of people think, oh, it's just a, you know, a, a beginning R grant. I can write that before the R01. That is not a beginning grant. Um, a lot of preliminary studies go on that. So the K99, uh, the, the K01, which would be, uh, you know, just a general uh, re research grant for uh, a trainee, that is probably has far less, um, you know, need for any preliminary studies. So the K99 is more of an advanced grant and has to have preliminary studies. Now, speaking of the R01, Dr. Dant, what are the chances to get funded for a good R01 application if the applicant has no previous training grants award, no previous training grants awards record? Well, um, an R01, um, you, you don't need to have uh, a training grant um, to, you know, to 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 write an R01. You could have come through a lab that, you know, the PI has a, you know, a long uh, history of funded R01s uh, or, you know, a, a couple of R01s and the, the uh, postdoctoral fellow could spend three or four years working with that investigator um, and not, and get, get their training, uh, not from a K or, but through just being on the R01 as, as say, a co-investigator, uh, some other collaborator, and get the training that way. Um, in terms, however, of, of doing your own research, uh, the investigator would require that you sort of break off into a separate, you know, area of the research, which has to be distinct from theirs, although it may be in the same field. And then they may be eligible for an R01, although the majority of investigators who, who go to R01s are coming from a K award. So if you don't have any preliminary uh, data or preliminary studies from a, from a K, 
it's harder to uh, gain acceptance. But the, the bottom line is if you do have some data and it's your own data and you've done the work, then uh, certainly you can apply for an R01 as a, as a new investigator, although most R01s are written by more established investigators. Dr. Dan, what is the maximum number of investigators in an R01 proposal? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. I, 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 uh, I, I mean, first of all, there's one principal investigators and a number of co-investigators, and you have to read the um, the um, the you you have to read the um, the unsolicited. Um, I gave you the numbers uh, RFA uh, for the for the unsolicited R01 grant to see what the rules on that are. I don't know what they are, but I, I'm pretty sure there are probably no more than four or five. But that's Thank different you. than having. But that's different than having um, collaborators. So a collaborator is somebody usually in another institution that is adding expertise to your to your grant. So you may have not a lot of expertise in a particular uh, um, methodology and are using a collaborator. Co-investigator co is usually somebody who has a major role in the grant, and there's usually rules for that, and they all have to submit uh, bio sketches. Thank you. Now, Dr. Dan, could you elaborate on writing out benchmarks in the approach section for, for an example? Yeah, benchmarks in the approach. Okay. Well, a lot of grants require that. Bigger grants, um, you know, the multi-PI grants do require that. Um, a lot of requests for applications from the NIH for, say, U grants, which are uh, cooperative agreements with the NIH, require benchmarks. And R01 does not, and uh, I can tell you what not to do. Um, please do not put a box together saying AIM-1, AIM-2, AIM-3, and then to the right of that, year one, year two, year three, year four, and just put a check mark. That, that, is, um, um, that probably will sink your grant when an investigator, when a, when a reviewer sees that. Each of the AIMs, um, Ha should you should have thought through what steps are required to get to that aim, to get to that endpoint. And a lot of times investigators, I just reviewed a grant yesterday uh, that had three specific aims, but each of the aims had three sub-aims. So they broke down the, the objectives uh, for that aim into smaller, um, you know, stepwise um, uh, uh, pieces, and those went into a benchmark. So those are the benchmarks for success, and um, those were then broken out as to when they would think they would accomplish those. Um, putting down things like writing a paper, uh, you know, applying for another grant or anything, is, those aren't benchmarks. Benchmarks are the specific objectives the specific points at which you feel you're going to get to to get to the next point in that aim. So you have to really think that through. And it's a very good thing to put in there if you have the room. You only have 12 pages um, because it gives the reviewer a lot of uh, confidence that you've thought through how you're going to do this work. And it'll, it'll summarize in some ways the work for them. But I've I've seen a lot of benchmarks that are very um, poorly put together and not thought through, and that would be worse than even putting one in. Thank you. Now, we have so many great questions coming in, and I want to remind our audience that those questions we do not have time to answer today and those coming in during the on-demand period will be answered by Dr. Dant via the, re the, the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. Now we have time for a few more. Dr. Dance, can you explain a little bit more on R01, R03, and R21 in terms of preliminary data required? Well, I already mentioned this. The R21 does require preliminary data. Well, let me put it this way. If you read the RFA or you read the unsolicited instructions for an R21 grant, it, it'll say in there somewhere that no preliminary data is required. But um, some of the institutes did a study a number of years ago, and I, I have a lecture on this that I present, and they showed that 
the vast majority of accepted R21s had preliminary data. Okay, so that means that that's what they want to see. They want to see some preliminary data. But understand that our R21 grant is not a, you know, a lot of people think of it as, well, I'll write the R21 first, and then I'll go to the R01. It is not a preliminary step to the R01. It is not a mini R01. It is an exploratory grant. So it's a two-year grant. Um, generally speaking, it's it's for in, going into unexplored uh, areas that, that have not been looked at. Now, does that mean you, you, I mean, generally you would think, well, that doesn't require preliminary data, but you really do need to have some background to, to get to that point. Why are you looking at this unexplored area? What are the, what are the areas that you've already seen and what, and, and even if it's unpublished, what have you done? So it does require, I, mean, I think that it would be much more likely to be funded with, with preliminary data and RL3 much less so. But know that an RL3, which is sort of a, um, it, 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 very few, first of all, not all agencies, 21 agencies at the NIH, the Institute, sorry, um, will fund an RL1. I'm sorry, <laughs> will fund an R21 or an RL3. An RL3 is even less uh, uh, accepted by many institutes. You have to look at the RL3, um, what they call the 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 unsolicited, um, you know, RFA, it's an RFA number, and read it and see which agencies are accepted, accept that. Um, there are certain actual requests for applications or parent announcements that are those RFAs for R21s or R R R03s, but not very many. R03 is, is a very small grant, usually for two years, $50,000, and it's, um, it, it, it is, generally doesn't require um, uh, uh, preliminary data. Um, it's to look at an explore, you know, an area that you, you just need some preliminary data, in. And, it, and it may be a good grant for a new investigator to start out just to gather some information, but again, it's very, very limited. R01s are far more accepted and uh, and um, common at the NIH, and you have to look that up. You have to look up the RFA. You have to look up the you know the the, the unsolicited uh, RFA number to get the information on those. Now, Dr. Dan, there is a perception that NIH proposals are not expected to be as hypothesis-driven as they were in the past. For example, some form of omics fishing expedition is more accepted these days. Could you give us your opinion on that? Well, I don't know uh, uh, where this individual has ever gotten this information, but I can tell you that that is completely false. If you, if you go out with uh, a series of experiments that are not based on any hypothesis or thought out um, problem that is very specific that you're testing, you're gonna get turned down. My opinion is that you will get turned down if you write a bunch of fishing expedition uh, proposals uh, based on you know, you know experiments that you'd like to do. Um, the NIH is looking for research that is hypothesis based. I know that for an absolute fact, and I've never heard that NIH proposals um, are today more le less hypothesis driven. That's just not true. It is not it is not true based on many of the people at the NIH I know and I've talked to, and it's not true based on many of the investigators that I work with who um, who write proposals. So, if you're writing an R01. You have to have a hypothesis. That that is shown. I showed you many slides um, that, and even research that backs that up. Dr. Janton, we're almost out of time, and we're going to end with this question. Can can you describe more about what the benefits and disadvantages are for R21? Yeah. Well. Um, let me, let me, yeah, it, it, it is, it, it's kind of a long answer. Um, I would recommend that you go online to the NIH and type in R21 unsolicited 
RFA. You'll find you'll find what the the parent announcement. That's what they're called. And this is what you apply for if your if your grant is unsolicited. That means it is not you're not applying to a particular RFA. And read what that grant, what that R21 the purpose is. It's a very very specific purpose. It's it's an exploratory uh, grant and. It, it is very different than an R01. R01 is a much more, you know, first of all, it's looking at a much bigger problem. It's looking at something that's going to go four years and R21 goes two years. The um, the, the grant, the, the R21 grant, it, 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 as I mentioned, is not a mini R01. It is not a, a preliminary step to an R01, but it's looking at areas of research that have been completely unexplored. I realize the R01 is going into innovative areas, but the R21 is looking at a specific and usually much narrower problem that's unexplored. And you're you're going into this uh with with the understanding that, you know, th these are areas that have not been looked at before. You're wanting to try and take a very narrow problem and look at it uh and it is written in a different way, even though the structure of the R21 is identical to an R01. The only difference is on the R21 and the R03, you only have six pages, not 12, to write your research strategy. It's a much more narrow uh, grant, and it has usually only one or two aims. Um, but I recommend to get a complete answer on that is to go to the R, just type in R21 NIH, and you'll find uh, usually the uh, unsolicited, um, you know, uh, parent announcement, which has a very specific wording from the NIH. Uh, and then if you go to the uh, NIAID, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases website, they have, they have sample grants and there are 21 grants in there that you can look at to see, you know, the level of detail and the kind of research that, even though it's an allergy and infectious diseases, it'll give you a flavor for the amount of information the R21, uh, you know, will, uh, will, uh, will be looked at. But I can tell you that not all institutes accept R21s unsolicited. And it's important that you know that before you start, I've unfortunately, uh, even for experienced investigators, I've had somebody send me a grant and they said, you, could you look at this? It's going to the NCI. It's an R21. It's looking at this particular area of esophageal cancer. And I said, well, the NCI doesn't accept R21s that are unsolicited. And he was completely unaware of that, wrote this entire proposal, took him several months, and he was flabbergasted. He said, well, what can I do with it? And I said, uh, write an R01 based on that. But uh, which he did, but you have to rewrite it. You can't just take it and expand it. You have to rewrite it. It's a different level of of, um, of writing. So hopefully that helps you, but I, I can't go into a lot of the specifics in R21. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Now, do you have any final comments for our audience? Well, no, I, I, I you know, other than, um, when you, you know, I, I wanted to emphasize the fact that anybody doing research, whether you have written an NIH grant or trying to write more, or you're considering writing one, or you've never written one, you may not write one, but you write uh, anything about your research, whether it's, um, you know, writing up, you know, your, the findings from your research to present at, you know, your um, journal club meetings or, you're a student and you have to present in front of your, your investigator and other students to show that you're, you know, that, you, you know, this is a skill you're trying to develop uh, or you're going to national meetings or you're, 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 you're writing a paper. It, it, the considerations I gave in writing this grant are very generalizable to those things. How you think about why this is an important study, why is it significant, why is it new? It's novel. What what makes it that way? And why will the study, uh, you know, really help us uh, move the field forward? That that idea of impact. That's those are the things that you should have in your in your head at a, at a high level, so that um, when you write or give a presentation, you go to a national meeting and you're putting your slides together. Put those things in there. I've gone to so many national meetings and I've seen slides and it just 
so much uh, gibberish and 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 unfortunately a lot of technical detail that the audience couldn't understand and I sit there and wonder why is this research being done? Why is it important? He never explained any of that. So um, if somebody's going to give you money or you're going to influence somebody, you better be able to say those things. And and we used to do a thing at Dartmouth where we would have each investigator stand up for 10 minutes and say, why am I doing this study? Why is it important? Tell me and tell me why it's innovative. What's new? What's exciting? What hasn't been done? And what will happen once I get the answers that I think I'll get by asking these questions? It, it's really helps uh, the investigators uh, think through their through through their work. Thank you, Dr. Dant, for your time today. I would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Leica Microsystems, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Now, this webcast can be viewed on demand shortly, and LabRoots will alert you via email when it is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day. Okay.